it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the fifth in our uh, Archaeology and the Westgate talks. And this is part of uh, an outreach programme which has been devised to accompany Oxford Archaeology's excavation at the Westgate on behalf of uh, Land Securities. And this evening I'm delighted to welcome Deidre O'Sullivan, who is a lecturer in Archaeology and Ancient History at the University of Leicester, who is going You've to... You've had the Ancient History, you don't know anything about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> who is going to be talking about uh, medieval friaries and about one of the little-known uh, religious orders uh, of uh, the medieval period. Mm -hmm. as well. Do I have to move something here? Yes. Yes. Right, just to say, uh, first of all, that my own interest in friaries actually uh, sprang from running a course with my colleague Neil Christie uh, on urban archaeology. Uh, and I realised that this was an area where there had been actually relatively little work. Uh, lots of things are known about medieval times. But friaries are one aspect of uh, medieval urban study about which there's actually relatively little uh, general research, although there is quite a lot of um, individual case studies. So I thought this would be an interesting thing to, to try to pull together, and I thought it would take me a couple of years to find out what kind of excavations have been going on. Um, I actually spent eight years working <laughs> on this project, in between doing a few other things as well, uh, including hanging on to my job somehow. Um, and I found it a very, very rewarding and, uh, I would go so far as to say, exciting um, uh, experience because indeed it seems that there are uh, many, many interesting stories to be told about individual friaries, but there are also bigger questions that can be engaged with, particularly about the relationship between friaries and towns, which is what I've named this lecture. Now, if, if people think about medieval friars, they think primarily probably about the figure of Francis of Assisi uh, and possibly also about uh, Dominic, uh, the Spanish founder of the Dominicans. Uh, they're both well-known figures from the Middle Ages. Francis probably a figure much more uh, popular and well-known in terms of contemporary faith uh, because of his uh, very charismatic uh, personality which has been translated through into the particularly the 19th and the 20th century understandings of uh, various kinds of Christian devotional practice. Uh, so he's got a kind of rather cuddly image, he preaches to the birds uh, and so on, uh, <laughs> preaches against the Crusades, we could do with him now, um, but, uh, um, but Dominic has a rather more scary image because of course he's, uh, he's closely associated with the papal inquisition and with the enforcement of religious orthodoxy. And that continued to be a role for friars uh, in the Middle Ages, although the Papal Inquisition was never um, enforced in Britain, so we don't have to cover those uh, nastier sides of uh, friary activity, uh, which happened in, the, uh, in mainland Europe, particularly in Italy. So friars have um, a popular image, which is, is seen as, as I say, uh, forthright and uh, uh, engaging with the practicalities of religious faith in the Middle But there were alternative opinions about friars around. Uh, and this is a very well-known <laughs> quote from Richard Fitzralph, a sometime Archbishop of Armagh, but he was actually at Oxford for quite a while. He did know friars. He would have met them in a number of uh, locations. He wasn't just talking off the top of his head. Um, we can see that he's highly critical of the mendicant orders. They have churches finer than our cathedrals. Their cellars are full of good wine. They have ornaments more splendid than those of any prelate in the world, save only our Lord Pope. I think the Pope was um, hanging on to his, uh, his jewels and treasures. They have more books and finer books than any prelate or doctor. Their belfries are most costly, remember that one. They have double cloisters in which armed knights could do battles with lances erect. They wear finer <laughs> raiment than any prelate in the world. Now, Fitzralph is writing, I think in some ways almost sinisterly, uh, about 1349 50, the year of the Black Death second year of the Black Death. Uh, and these are his concerns. He actually goes to Avignon to uh, present his critique of the mendicant orders <coughs> to the Pope, or one of the Popes at that time. Uh, and uh, 
he's very critical of them also in his diet. He, uh, he's, he, he berates the fact that they basically offer confessions for cash, as he sees it, uh, and that they are uh, very easy on the parishioners or on, on his own. <laughs> In his own diocese, who he thinks should actually have a, a sort of a, a much sterner hand uh, held over them. Now, the interesting thing for archaeologists, of course, is that he's actually quite specific about the material culture of medieval Florence. We're talking about double cloisters, uh, books, uh, fine raiment, good wine, and so on. And it'll be interesting to see how much fine raiment and uh, uh, so forth actually comes out of the Westgate project. Probably <laughs> nothing. Um, but it is one of the, the challenges, obviously, with archaeology to, to match or to, uh, to oppose uh, also textual and uh, material evidence. Now, moving, moving on from Fitzralph's 14th century rant, uh, I want to turn briefly to another figure who has uh, been a very uh, important figure in, in, in medieval urban in history, uh, Jacques Le Goff, who proposed a thesis uh, in the 1970s, 69, 70, thereabouts, in which he argued that the presence of houses of mendicant friars in the 13th century was a very good index of the extent to which places were actually urbanised, the degree of urbanisation within them. His thesis dealt with France, uh, and subsequent to that, other studies were, were done in Italy, and in Hungary, and in Belgium, and Germany, which tended to uh, support the general thesis that numerous houses of mendicants, or the very presence of mendicants, was a, a measure of how urbanised, how um, engaged with what we would call urban activities as distinct from uh, semi or quasi or rural activities, uh, a place had become by the 13th century. So uh, at the, the ground level we have the idea that mendicants are tied in with the development of towns, uh, but also uh, that they uh, had their critics uh, which focused mostly on how they had developed and their practices of piety and So just a quick summary for anybody who uh, was interested in what makes mendicant friars distinctive. Um, they were created, so the order started in the beginning of the 13th century, 1215, as usually the orders take different points of departure, but it, it, the, um, the Dominicans and the Franciscans are kind of consolidated in 1215, and in the years after that they spread all over Europe and they found houses in many different countries. <coughs> the two other orders that we find uh, in Britain, the Carmelites and the Austin Friars, start off a bit later in the uh, 1340s. And there are two minor orders who are um, abolished, wiped out, uh, closed down, whatever term you want to use, uh, in 1375. This is probably an index of actually how uh, popular and influential the mendicant orders are becoming, and the Pope was persuaded that there should be no more new orders of friars. Following on from Francis and Dominic, they had an urban mission uh, to preach and also to maintain orthodoxy, which involved them in, in scholarship and particularly in engagement with the universities that were obviously developing at the same time. They had no landed property, and this was actually true for mendicants in the way that it was not true for Benedictines or Austin canons. They weren't supposed to receive gifts of property at all, uh, and initially they didn't even own the properties in which they lived. So they had no regular income, they had no revenue coming from land and estate. And at the Reformation in England, it's quite clear that that actually held true uh, down into the 16th century. When valuations are available through the valor, for example, um, it's clear that very, very small sums uh, in terms of fixed income were attached to mendicants. And they were probably all things that they received as chantry requests, because they didn't own estates. That's not totally true, there were a few priories that did have small estates, uh, but basically they didn't have a reliable income from that kind of um, source at all. They were also largely independent of diocesan control, that's one of the reasons why Fitzralph didn't like them, in fact it's probably the main reason why he didn't like them. Um, and another aspect of their mission was that they were licensed for burial. They weren't initially licensed for burial, they usually had to get permission from that, but by the late 13th or early 14th century, it was common for them to admit people to bury within the friary church or within uh, a churchyard next to it. Now this is just a quick graph, we don't want to spend too much time on this, uh, but we can see there the different orders of friars, not, I'm afraid, colour-coded to their habits, 
uh, but we have the Franciscans and the Dominicans to begin with, and then we have uh, the start of other orders. The great founding period is the 13th century, but orders of new houses continue to be founded <coughs> into the 14th century, and indeed all the way through to the beginning of the 15th century, but very few new foundations after the Black Death. And then right at the end of this period, we have the introduction of observing friars uh, under the sponsorship of Henry VII uh, at the end of the 15th century. I'm not going to be uh, really talking about those, but just to realise that there was a reform movement in Europe which touched Britain. It was a much more impact in Ireland than it had in Britain. Uh, but that uh, created three new friaries and reformed uh, another three. So we can see the disappearance of the, uh, the sack friars and the pine friars uh, after uh, 1280 in this graph. They don't found any new houses, but the others do. Uh, these maps, I'm afraid they might seem a bit complicated, a little bit out of focus. I don't know if... Mm -hmm. Is it out of focus to you? A bit. A little bit. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can do anything about that. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, again, the first map is to 1250, where we have only a, a majority of houses, a great majority of houses, mm -hmm. Dominicans and Franciscans. Not a lot in the north. Um, that changes. By 1300, we can see that priories have to be found much more widely distributed. And there are also more friaries in individual places. Yeah, on these maps, the, the name refers to when a friary has been founded. So existing friaries are little black dots. <coughs> New houses uh, come on with additional names. Uh, <clears throat> and here we can see that by 1350, the, the friary map is still getting um, new, new houses. Um, and by 1500, we're all complete there now, really, um, late in the day. Uh, every friary that was ever going to be founded had been founded by 1500 in, um, in the Middle Ages. Now, friaries at the Reformation, number 188, again, this is a rather broad brush approach to, to looking at the kind of evidence that survives for them. But above ground evidence, as we can see, uh, is actually very scarce. And I think if we look to compare this with Benedictine houses, we would find that there's less of friaries as a general rule. I haven't done that comparison, so I don't want to pretend that that's a statistic uh, that has any great substance, but it's clear to me that we, we are very short on above ground evidence for friaries because even when I've said above ground evidence, in many cases that's actually quite, uh, quite, quite small, uh, not very much surviving. There aren't many friaries, we'll be looking at some of them soon, uh, where we have substantial remains of, of a range of buildings. Uh, if we look at um, excavation, we can see that there's a certain amount of nothing or negative intervention. I'm tearing my hair out over what counted as a minor intervention. In the field archaeology, I'll just want to know that you can count practically anything as a minor intervention. Um, but uh, major interventions are not, again, particularly large, but there are a number of them. An issue to come out of this is that quite a lot of these major interve interventions or medium interventions uh, are unpublished. Um, and another point to make about friaries is that, on the whole, they were they were successful in their own terms in the Middle Ages. Uh, apart from the the pied friars and the sack friars, um, the great majority of uh, friaries continued through the Middle Ages, but they did relocate. And this um, map here just shows the where we have excavations at some of those early friary sites that, that, that were closed or relocated. So we don't know very much really about the pied or the sack friars at all. Well, there's no reason to think they were necessarily very different from the other friars. Now, the sources that we have for the history of friars are usually, there's something there at the beginning, and there's something there at the end. There's often not an awful lot in between. So we often have evidence for the foundation of friars, which appears in the pagan roads and the close roads, which record gifts of timber from the royal forests and pittances uh, to the friars in the 13th and the centuries. When uh, the king stayed in a town and stayed at the friary, necessarily always in the friary, or they commonly did, did use them as stop-off points, it was the, the habit to make a gift to the friary of four pence per friar per day. And this expenditure is recorded in, in the rows, so we know, we can make a calculation on that basis of how many friars were actually at individual houses at that point in time. 
it shifts about quite a bit, and it seems that friars were quite mobile between one house and another. So, um, if, for example, the king stopped off in Carlisle in 1300 in January and was uh, back there again in November, I think he probably was there on both on at least two occasions in that year. Uh, the numbers that actually recorded for the, the Carlisle Friary might, might vary quite a bit in that period, often by as much as 15-20%. So it's not an absolute statistic, but it's clear that we can get some information about the numbers of friars at houses. The other end of the story is, of course, what I call the, the artefacts of suppression. Uh, and here in 1538 and 1539, the priories were closed, sort of middle stage of the suppression of the monasteries. A great majority of them were closed by one man, uh, Richard Ingworth. Uh, he made records. About a, I think these records survived for probably about a third of all priories, but they come in, in, in different fashions. He, um, first of all, he took the surrender of the priory the friars in the house would sign that with their names, so we have records of who was actually in the priory at the time. Um, there was also usually an inventory, this is a, the surrender is at the bottom here, this is the actual surrender, and that was in Latin, and it was done on parchment, it was an official document that handed the site over to the crown. Uh, but there are also other, and for an from an archaeological perspective, more interesting documents that were compiled, including inventories of the goods in the house, which often also lists the buildings that were present. Uh, and there's intermittent correspondence as well, quite a lot of correspondence with Thomas Cromwell dealing with the suppression of priories. As everybody knows, Thomas Cromwell was attainted in 1540 and his personal records were seized and uh, these went into the National Archives and, and they can be obviously consulted today. In fact, they've been, they've been widely published since the 19th century. So this correspondence with Thomas Cromwell there's also quite a lot of insight into what was happening in the Friars at the very end of the Middle Ages. And arising from that, we can also access what post-dissolution uses of Friars became. Now, the surrender required that the Friars handed over their property to the Crown in the first instance, basically. If they didn't bother, Cromwell had learned his lesson, he wasn't fooling around with any intermediate purchases, as it were, or payments on the basis of pat patrons or anything like that. As far as he was concerned, these houses were surrendered to the Crown, and they were then Crown property. The Crown wanted to basically offload them fairly rapidly and wanted to get revenue on the basis, usually of the land rather than the buildings. The buildings were not deemed to be particularly uh, valuable, although they, they were frequently leaded, and that was a commodity that was much desired. Now, one of the things that you pick up uh, in the letters of Cromwell is this rhetoric about putting these friaries, which were redundant places of worship, to some godly purpose. And all I can say, like a lot of rhetoric, it doesn't actually go very far. If you look at what they were mostly converted to, we have a pale blue and a, and a dark blue, but basically they became private property or, or, or private residences. Quite a lot of them simply were left to be derelict. It wasn't very profitable to the Crown to actually dissolve the Friars because they didn't have estates. That was what most of the dissolutions were about, basically, you know, about getting hold of the, uh, the, the income from the estates of monasteries. And they didn't do very well out of Friars in that respect, but they did um, seize anything that they thought had value in terms of uh, church plate or things like that. And the inventories record possessions of the house, so it includes stuff about bedding. A bit about furniture and, from my point of view, the most interesting things, it tells you quite a lot about what was in their kitchens. So we've got quite a lot of evidence for lifestyle in the 16th century. Whether that can be translated backwards uh, is, of course, uh, a moot point. Sorry, I'm going so now to look at some actual priories. Um, this is a fairly well preserved site, although quite far away from here. It's home in Northumberland, and it's either the first or the second foundation of the Carmelite Friars in Britain. Uh, it, it was founded in uh, the 1240s, and it was founded by a returning crusader who brought with him, so they say, um, eremitic monks from uh, Mount Carmel, hence the name Carmelite. Right. And the 
the story goes, uh, <coughs> this is part of the, the history of the, the Carmelite order, that he, he set them up on his, uh, his property. A uh, parallel place was created, Aylesford in Kent, so at either end of the country, these two uh, returning barons, Dvesky and Gray, uh, established houses of this order. <laughs> the one thing you notice about this place <laughs> is that it's not in a town. Uh, and uh, the early stages of the orders of um, <coughs> Austin Friars and Carmelites were often not, not urban or not very urban. Uh, but by the end of the 12th, by about 1247 48, uh, they had switched over, if you like, and were following the papal direction to establish their houses in towns. But I find it interesting that these places were not changed, they were not abandoned, they, they kept what they had already received. And there's a lot of um, internal reflection, particularly within the Carmelite order, about the origins of their order in the Holy Land, something which they were very proud. There's been quite a lot of recent uh, historical research on that. Now here, this is a property that passed to the, the Percys, like most of Northumberland, and uh, it's private land, but you can actually access it as a, uh, it's, a it's, it's accessible to the public. Um, uh, and we can see here uh, some of the things that have survived there. Now this is argued to be one of the most um, well-preserved friary complexes, and certainly it's interestingly also one of the best recorded. There's actually, actually a cartillery for a home priory. There are only four cartilleries actually surviving from priories and that is all to do with the fact that they didn't actually possess property so they didn't have need of a cartillery or they have very small quantities of property and that kind of deed is not a normal record. But the reason why home is like this is because it does have a small estate of about 40 or 50 acres, not very large, but they did have provision that was tied to them in terms of um, income from the mill and stuff like that. It makes them look a lot more like a regular uh, monastic house than the urban complex. One of the interesting things about this particular house is that the tower, which you can see there um, and there, uh, is actually a residence for the, uh, the patronal family. Um, it was in use as a residence in the later Middle Ages. That's something that we see happening in, in cities as well, but this is a, an unusual place, so in some ways it's rather a pity that our best recorded places is, is largely probably typical. But if you look at the, the church, you can see the, this is the church here, um, we have also the infirmary. Um, one of the things I would say about friary architecture and friary style in general is that it does map on quite well to the aspirations of the orders in the early 13th century to have a very simple building style and uh, not to uh, go in for fine ashlar or fancy tracery or basically any kind of um, luxurious accommodation and, and apartments. Not every friary was like that, certainly the London friaries were not like that at all. Um, Coventry probably wasn't like that. But a lot of friaries were actually uh, very simple buildings without uh, the need to necessarily uh, expand, develop and change their architecture uh, as time goes by. And if you look at that plan of the church there, the plan is probably a bit more important than the, the room. Um, we can see that we have a nave and a choir, which is which are basically about the same length, uh, with a uh, passage in the middle, which is known as a walking place, uh, and that's a very characteristic early family plan. There are no transepts, there are no aisles, and there's no um, uh, not usually any, there's not usually any accommodation which would uh, encourage things like the cult of relics or anything like that. Now the nave is intended to be open to the general public and the choir obviously for, uh, for the friars themselves and generally the choir would have been invisible during divine service. That's not unusual, it's the same for uh, indeed many parish churches as well as monastic orders. Uh, but we get the impression this is quite a solid partition uh, between the friars and their choir and the, uh, the congregation who, who came there to attend services. Now moving on to another house which has uh, interesting origins. Mm -hmm. now, this is the Friary of Clare. Uh, lovely story, it is now again a Friary of the Austin Friars. It's the centre of the, um, the 21st century province of Austin Friars in, in England. Uh, but this was founded again uh, in the 13th century for the Austin Friars. It's their first house. What survives isn't 13th 
13th century in terms of the wall, and it seems to have been um, rebuilt at a slightly later stage, or we could perhaps also see quite a long development of that when early um, church is established, and then the rest of the monastic buildings get built uh, over time. I think one of the lovely things about this building is that it doesn't look in the least bit like a friary. If you, if you look at that wonderful um, pink Suffolk <laughs> plaster, so characteristic of the, of the region, uh, it's only the, the doorway in the bottom, I think, that would give you any clue that you're actually looking at a monastic range. Uh, the infirmary building, uh, to the side of it, uh, was used by the current friars as their church, but they've now built a new one, so that uh, is going to be used as a sort of antechamber. Uh, and the other thing that Clare Priory is, is known for is that it was uh, it had quite close links with, with the Crown and Joan of Acre, uh, Edward the Third's daughter, is buried there. Now here we actually have excavated evidence and surviving buildings, not a huge amount of excavation. It was done by St. John Hope in the late 19th century, but he, he did a plan of the building. At the Reformation, this passed to a family who held on to it for three or four hundred years. I think that's why uh, it's in such a, an interesting state of preservation. And here again, there is actually a cartel. So that's two out of my four. The other two are very small. <laughs> now, this is a real treasure. Um, this is a timber range at Clare, which I think is probably quite early. Uh, if you look at the interpretation that's offered in the, the original plan that was produced by St. John, he says that this is a 15th century courtyard. And I'm not any expert in Timber Johns, there might be people in the room who are, uh, but when I've shown this to people, they've gone, that looks very early to me. Uh, so uh, hopefully a little project that might arrive from that to get a date of it, but certainly I suspect that this might actually be a bit of a timber cloister surviving in Clare. Uh, it's currently used as a chapel. Um, it obviously is a, <coughs> a bit of a treasure really, needs to be carefully nurtured, uh, but it is in use, which is often uh, a good sign keeping things in, in a decent state of preservation. And also, you, if you look at the stained glass window, uh, those glass pieces are all things that have been picked up literally in the flower beds by the friars who are there today uh, and incorporated in the glazing uh, friary. <coughs> and of course, it's ongoing, and this is obviously something that people are very conscious of with Westgate, that places don't stay still, uh, and they've built a new church now on ground that is archaeologically sterile. Uh, lots of purists uh, will say they shouldn't have been allowed to do that because it doesn't fit in with the medieval buildings. Uh, but they're very keen on the idea that they're a functioning friary and place of worship and that, that for them is uh, vital to their role. But they're also very keen on preserving the medieval buildings, which is nice as well. Uh, another remarkable building uh, in a very good state of preservation is the dormitory at Coventry White Friars. Uh, here we do have a building which is more ambitious, a red stats in the building, more ambitious uh, architecturally than a lot of the primary ranges uh, that we'll see elsewhere. And we have a feature that's very characteristic of priories uh, in terms of their cloisters. This is an undershot cloister. You don't have a, a projecting a cloister walk around the inside of the cloister. The, the cloister walk is incorporated into the footprint of the building. Uh, and it usually results in quite a wide passage. That is also obviously very structural to the building. Now, uh, Coventry White Press went through a slightly sorry history. It, it was sometime a uh, workhouse and very nearly got demolished to assist in the Coventry Ring Road creation. <laughs> but it survived that. It survived that. Uh, and um, sadly, it was, it was a museum for much of the 80s. It was closed by the City Council and a museum in, in terms of local authority cutbacks. And it's now used as a store. And I think this is an, an abomination. If I had any say in it, I would make sure that it went back to be open to the public again. Because there are very few friary buildings around that people can actually visit, and this is a very well preserved one. The upstairs part of it, which I, don't, I haven't got a decent picture, in fact, because it's full of boxes, you can't take decent pictures and you can't, uh, there isn't even any light. But that actually preserves the divisions in the dormitory for uh, little study bedrooms. And that's something that we see elsewhere at Gloucester. Uh, this is a, um, a wonderful building, complete with its 13th century roof, with even records for where they got the timber for the roof. It's a, it's a wonderful story. The, the, the church roof and the dormitory roof are both preserved 13th century roofs, scissor brace roofs. And if you look at that carefully, you can see along the side that there are imposts. Some of them have been built up with, with bricks, but these are all um, divisions with windows in between that actually 
designated the family to study bedrooms for the, the medieval friars at Gloucester. Gloucester is, is probably the, the most accessible medieval friary complex. It's got a church and two ranges that are really well, decently well preserved. So if I'm persuading you that perhaps the, the grandeur of friaries is, is, is not uh, you know, Fitzroth's uh, case for friaries having magnificent buildings isn't very strong, uh, perhaps we can look a bit more carefully at the accusation that he made about belfries, <coughs> uh, saying how tremendous they were. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because in fact most of the belfries, I like to say all, you should never say all, should you, it's not famous, but the great majority of the belfries that survived post-date his, um, his time, date from the late 14th and 15th century. But interestingly, they do have uh, a characteristic style. Not, again, I'm not saying they're all identical, but it's this idea that the belfry is actually a, um, a tower that's constructed over the passing, the walking place, the space between the nave and the choir. Uh, it starts out on a rectangular plinth, but then it becomes a hexagonal tower once it gets through the roof. The earliest priories don't seem to have had belfries at all, that we can see, so in the 13th century we haven't been able to securely identify foundations for belfries. Um, but in, in terms of the 14th century the period that he's talking about, there's no evidence to, to so far when we look at the, the footprints to think that these, these spaces were ever any different, they weren't any bigger, and they probably couldn't have supported anything very different uh, from what went up in the 15th century. Now these are quite nice little belfries, if we look at the little one there at Atherston in Warwickshire, uh, there you can see a, a small um, it's really just kind of one stage of a uh, belfry with its uh, octagonal windows. The one in King's Lynn is probably the most famous, and that survived the Reformation because it was uh, seen as a local landmark. Uh, the one at the top is, is Norwich Blackfriars, which survived. That does look quite big, actually, doesn't it? Uh, but it, uh, it collapsed in the 18th century, and so it's uh, no longer with us. And there are evidence, of course, for there is evidence for, for, for the presence of very magnificent looking timber frame buildings. This is a painting of the dormitory at Ipswich Blackfriars. Fantastic canopy roof with um, you can see paintings in the ceilings and all the rest of it. Uh, obviously now completely derelict and I'm afraid to say no longer with us at all. Uh, but interesting to see the kind of space created uh, here. The windows obviously on one side look like they must be later insertions. Yeah. It was uh, in use as a spoon. <coughs> so that's friary buildings. If we want to look back now again at friars uh, in towns, to consider where those buildings were in towns and how they related perhaps to the use of urban space, which is really where I started looking uh, several years ago. The evidence we have for this is of course post-medieval because uh, we don't have detailed of uh, English towns. Uh, and this is a very early depiction of Plymouth in the 16th century. I think these maps, these 16th century ones, are mostly um, compiled for defensive purposes uh, and to give the crown some idea of um, access, uh, seaward access particularly, uh, onto, the, um, onto the town. There are actually <coughs> two priories in this picture. Probably, if, you're, if you can read it, is this, is this out of focus or is this me? <laughs> it's not bad. It's not bad. I just want to hesitate to tweet. Does anybody want to whittle with the lens and see if they can get it? I don't know if you can. Can you? Maybe there's some electronic control over it. Right, right. 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 if, if it's okay, then let's see. I can't see. Can't see. Right. Oh, well done. Yay. That is better, isn't it? Yeah. That is actually the White Friars, it's underneath Plymouth Station at the moment, I think it's going to be called Friars Station. Um, there's nothing left of it at all now, but uh, you can see here on the Belfry theme that we have something that looks like quite a squat tower with quite a large steeple on top. Um, if you want to get people talking about steeples on Friary churches, I think I've uh, heard a couple of people on the, on the advisory panel get excited about this. Uh, it's not the kind of thing that you can really recover from an excavation. So the evidence for steeples are they can only ever be either with surviving buildings, of which they're, um, I've just shown you the towers that, 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 that survive. Um, there is actually a steeple on the 
<coughs> Brave Friars of Canterbury, but that's a, a later edition. Um, but anyhow, this White Friars uh, here is shown with a steeple. Now the problem is that with a lot of these 16th century maps, it's very difficult to work out what's for real and what's just somebody's <laughs> idea of what a place ought to look like. <laughs> so it's a source, but it's a source that needs to be uh, used with caution. This is a, a much more um, convincing representation, I think, here. Uh, again, uh, created for the purposes of defence, uh, of nervousness about the Scots in northern England, in the middle of the 16th century. And we know from uh, <coughs> accounts that the pale which you can see around the, the building there was actually built in, it, it was uh, paid for in about 1540. And the only <coughs> surviving inside is the Black Friars. Nothing left of that, of course, at all now. Um, and again, if you look carefully, perhaps you can work out. Well, it's obviously there's a cloister and a building sticking out from it, which I uh, understood to be the church. There's another building in the corner, inside the building, <coughs> which could be related to the friary or could conceivably be a new building. And we can see the area inside the friary uh, precinct is laid out in gardens uh, and mm. plots. Now, friary precincts are quite large. When we say friaries are different from other kinds of monks, but in fact they often had quite large precincts. The idea that they were shoehorned into small spaces in towns is only true for some places. Uh, and uh, here we can see a precinct which I think has been, uh, on other grounds calculated, has been about five or six acres. Some of them were much bigger than that. Bedford, for example, had a precinct of about 16 acres. So that gives you a lot of um, subsistence support, if you like, within the precinct. So quite a lot of the basic foodstuffs in terms of fruit and vegetables, orchards and so on, could have been provided. What happens at the Reformation and in the, in the run-up in the last decade or so before the suppression is that these plots get leased out. Um, things like the cemetery, for example, were leased out for grazing. Presumably people had stopped burying them, or maybe this was a, something that didn't perturb people at all. You have a lush grass growing, why shouldn't you graze your sheep on it? But um, the evidence for this kind of use of, of space inside farms comes from these kinds of depiction and also from suppression accounts and leases. This is probably the best one, right? The best 16th century plan of what the looks like. Uh, the, the original was done by Thomas Langton in 1549 and what has survived is only an 18th century copy. Maybe the original will turn up someday and maybe this has been um, over adapted, nicified perhaps by the 18th century illustrator. But it's a very uh, exciting plan because we can see the Blackfriars complex there, which spans the River Stour. We can see the areas of orchards, and we can see particularly the way in which the friary is separated from the tenements and houses by a gated passage. You see the gate at the top, and then right down at the bottom here is another one. This is the Grey Friars, uh, and we have here two opposing gates into the, each of the friaries, the Grey Friars here and the Blackfriars there. If we look at the cloister of the Blackfriars, we can see this building very carefully depicted, and it's obviously the same building, but it's still there today. If you look uh, at the frontage on the star, uh, you can see, I hope, if you look carefully, the projecting uh, extension, which is the pulpit of the, um, the refectory. And that's it there. Right? So clearly, Langdon uh, was, had an eye for detail and was depicting things as he saw them. And we know he had a good eye because the evidence is before us still. So in that context, let's look at the church, which is at right angles. It's a long building uh, running backwards. And we can see there three lancet windows, right? No tower, no differentiation in the roof line between choir and nave. Cloister to one side. I'm not going to worry too much about the windows there. Um, it looks as though we have here, I would say possibly the original or very early version of the Friary Church that was built there in the 13th century. So it hasn't been improved on, it hasn't had uh, lots of fancy windows added, it hasn't had extensions or lines added. Uh, terrible pity that it's not with us now, because it would uh, have been a very useful example of an early Friary Church perhaps. 
But again, you can see the layout of the plots and the use of the land post medieval use, uh, presumably taking over earlier divisions into orchards and kitchen gardens. Uh, if we go to speed, um, some good, some bad. Um, this is a good one uh, in that what speed shows is very similar to what is there today as well. Uh, this is Speed's plan of Hereford. This is the Blackfriars at the top, which he correctly labels inside a rectangular precinct. And again, if we look at what's there today, he shows um, uh, the preaching cross, which has been entirely reconstructed in the Victorian period, but presumably based on something that was there originally. Um, it shows a range, which I think is part of the, oh, I think it's the West Range, uh, and uh, he shows another kind of um, another couple of little bits of ruin. Uh, within the precinct. Uh, and this is a, a, a much um, battered building, I suppose one could say, uh, but uh, it's interesting that the, the depiction of the speed uh, is, is convincing. Um, it's much harder to be sure of what's going on here. Um, were there actually no buildings in these spaces, or was there no need to depict them for the purposes of the map? They would have been outside the walls. And there are three friaries in, um, in Shrewsbury, uh, only two of these are actually shown here. Uh, but um, it's not terribly helpful basically to give us some idea of how the friaries related to urban space, except that they're clearly outside the walls and it looks that at this point in time, they are, when Speed is showing the town, uh, he's not concerned to show whether, there, um, whether there's any building or any external um, development there. And it is indeed in a low-lying area. Now, uh, Oxford, a place obviously familiar to all of you, uh, you've probably seen fancier maps of Oxford Friars than this, uh, but here again we can see how the, uh, the Blackfriars uh, acquired an estate, it's the second site of the Blackfriars that we're looking at here, they had an earlier estate uh, inside the, the town. But of course the issue with Oxford is that the urban space is extremely constrained, is it not, from the 10th century, there's very little room. So it's not at all, I mean, there's plenty of urban, of suburban development uh, in Oxford in the 13th century. So you've got a very kind of squeezed urban space, and here all the friaries are outside the boundaries of the Saxon town. And uh, obviously, if you've been keeping abreast of what's happening uh, with the Franciscan friary, you'll know that there's now some hot new information about the city wall and how it fitted into the precinct. Um, uh, another uh, very different kind of uh, situation here, uh, Carmarthen. Um, Carmarthen is probably the most extensively excavated friary in the country. Uh, very well excavated site, um, two courtyards and part of the church dug in the uh, 1990s. But um, if we look at the location of it, we can see some of the problems with trying to get towns off the ground in Wales. Um, the very spread out uh, way in which the town was allowed to coalesce, if that's the right word. We have a new town, New Carmarthen, created around the castle, uh, and that's where the priory goes. But we also have the original kind of class church in the town fields, and the earlier priory, St John's Priory, which is, um, which is to the north of that. So, in some ways, there would have been space for this priory to um, become part of the medieval town and be surrounded by virgin burgage plots. But that wasn't really how things happened. So, one of the things that's emerged from looking at friaries in general is that they moved about quite a bit. Not necessarily very far, but they did opportunistically relocate themselves within <laughs> urban space. However, when I tried to work out whether there was any general trend, it didn't really work out that way. Some moved from within to within, some moved from without to within, some moved from without to without, and some moved from within to without. Uh, and uh, the only thing I can say with this is that if people tell you that friaries were shoehorned in, shoe inside uh, urban walls, that it wasn't as nearly as simple as that. Uh, but I, I'm not sure that we can really see a convincing overall trend. I think it's much better to think of these things in terms of the specific places that you're looking at and think of the reasons why things are where they are there. <coughs> so I next want to just look at the excavation legacy. <coughs> um, lots of excavations, most of them are small, quite a lot of them are unpublished, 
there's quite a lot in the Ray literature, and I would argue that we need to start writing about places in a different way and to recognise the potential of sites rather than simply looking for claustral plans. We need to be looking for evidence for lifestyle, particularly one thing that we're really very, very short on in Friars is evidence for um, bioarchaeology, um, environmental evidence, evidence for diet and, and uh, stuff that you can get from drains and pits and that sort of stuff. We really haven't got much of that at all because the people have been doing excavations um, and many of them are very old excavations. I've referred to excavations in the, in the 1890s, for example, but there are other uh, more recent ones that still aren't terribly important. Um, we really desperately need that kind of corpus of archaeological evidence, not just to find out where the cluster ranges are, which will usually be where you might expect them to be, um, but actually trying to get a fuller uh, picture of life ways. <coughs> now there's a problem with excavations um, and with reconstructions because of the way in which they've been done. Uh, this is a lovely example of a site which has been laid out, it was laid out by the Marcus of Butte at his own expense, a very uh, wealthy figure in uh, Welsh antiquarian history. But I have no idea how much of this he actually found. Um, the excavations were done before the First World War, I think. I think that between the First and the Second. No, between the... Anyhow, that doesn't matter. Uh, but his aim was to create the plan of a priory in the park for the benefit of all. And uh, you know, in Leicester, in Abbey Park, 1920s and 30s, they had exactly the same thing. Uh, they found a little bit of something and then they you know, cre recreated a plan uh, to uh, indicate how it ought to be. There isn't an excavation report as such. Um, the interesting thing about this plan, of course, is that it shows again two, two courtyards. Um, it wasn't a very big priory, but it shows two courtyards. And interestingly, a, a nave that contracted in the course of the Middle Ages, originally two extra bays there, that is actually commented on in, in the account of the site, so I assume that they, they were aware that that had happened. Uh, but we see here a choir which uh, is about the same length as the, um, as the nave, but the nave actually in this case has two eyes because the cluster is on the north side. We have no sign of any kind of tower there at all. Now back to Coventry Whitefriars, if we look here at the plan, this is a late foundation, uh, just before the Black Death, uh, the, the foundation was created, and it was built in the course of the late 14th and indeed uh, the late, in the late 15th century. And we're here looking, I think, at a rather different kind of church. Um, the guy who's the founder here is a guy called Pulteney, who is um, big in the city of London. I think he must have been from Coventry, but anyhow, he decided that he would uh, look for the repair of his soul uh, in Coventry and he put a lot of resource into funding the construction of the church although he wasn't actually buried there um, and here we can see I think a much more ambitious building uh, in terms of architecture uh, but also um, one that is relatively late in the story of Friars Dunstable is a, a much more frustrating site archaeologically uh, it was partly dug in the 1920s, and then there was an ongoing project run by the Manshead Archaeological Group. I don't know if anybody has ever come across them, but they, uh, they were a very um, enthusiastic amateur group which operated in the 1960s, and I think into the early 70s. The site was dug piecemeal, and it was dug under the misapprehension that these features here, which we now interpret as a tree garden, an orchard, a regulator, possibly an ornamental tree garden of some kind, um, were the post homes of a large Roman building. Uh, it's quite a funny story, to state the, um, nobody has ever pulled this together or published it. Um, there are some interim reports that were produced and I've stuck this together uh, myself uh, with a view to trying to get some overall idea of what the primary layout was like. But uh, these things are really quite challenging. I mean, this is a, this is a particular, I would use the word dog's dinner. It was particularly challenging to try and pull these disparate elements that were called uh, many different intervals um, together. It looks as though we've probably got the Friary Church there, but the alignment is extremely curious. It's very far out of east-west. 
and yeah, I hope you've got buttresses, so that will do, but buttresses and burials are probably looking at part of the names there. Uh, but uh, even though this, there was a lot of um, engagement and involvement with the site, uh, and very famously the Dunstable Swan Jewel was found there in 1960, I think on the spoil the most wonderful things <coughs> are found there. Um, it's still quite difficult to, uh, to get a, an overall grasp of, of exactly how uh, those buildings and the precinct, I think it's very interesting that they have dug up that much in the precinct and, and brought out this uh, ornamental element, um, how that worked out. Now Dunstable was quite, I don't know much about Dunstable as a place, but it was quite a big friary in the, uh, in the 13th and 14th centuries, I think it had up to 40 friaries in one state. So if we're going back to Le Goff's index of uh, urbanisation, then Dunstable was obviously heading somewhere that perhaps it never quite got to uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, and um, it's to the future, really, that uh, uh, the urban challenge would uh, appear much later on. Now this, I think, is my, my last excavation site, which is the most recent excavation that I've been directly involved in myself at the Leicester Grave Prize. Uh, as I'm sure everybody in the room is aware, King Richard III was found in the Grave Prize by the most extraordinary sets of, uh, well, just most extraordinary sets of uh, things working out, hypotheses being tried, tested, and eventually the, the grave was identified and then identified uh, using DNA and other uh, scientific techniques. Um, but the, the upside of this for me particularly was that we actually found out something about the Leicester Grave Rats, about which we had previously known very little. And we still don't know very much. Uh, but we do have now got a decent plan of the choir of the, uh, the, the Friary Church. We know that the area to the west of that, where the walking place should have been, so just the far side of His Majesty's grave, that was completely trashed, uh, uh, possibly at the Reformation, but certainly at some subsequent <coughs> point in time. Um, and we think that was probably because there were large stone foundations of a, uh, a belfry over the, the, the walking place, and they were pulled out in the ensuing um, impossibility of working out any kind of adequate spatial relationships there. But we did pick up a lot of detail about the choir, and particularly, uh, and interestingly, we found this um, this lead coffin burial in what we would call prime position uh, below the steps of the altar. Uh, when this was opened up, um, it was found to have a female skeleton inside it, and probably uh, of senior years, I say about 60, but I'm not being precise there, definitely uh, quite an elderly woman who had been buried uh, in this position. We've no idea who she was, unlike what she was heard. Uh, she occupied the space that perhaps people might have thought His Majesty should have occupied in the Friary, but it was already taken. There might even have been a slab or a, you know, a fancy tomb on top that uh, would have protected the space. Now, burial in Friaries uh, was allowed for parishioners, but they, uh, they had to pay a fee, and they sometimes had to pay, uh, very speaks about this, they had to pay a fee to their parish church as well in order to get buried in the Friary out of that. Um, and quite a lot of people were buried in Friaries. I've, I've mentioned Joan Haker, who's buried at Clare. Uh, but here are a couple of other um, tombs of people who were buried in Friaries and whose tombs have been, re have been moved uh, or uh, shifted at the Reformation. Um, this is particularly interesting in the case of the Carmarthen Grave Friars, where uh, Henry's Henry VIII's grandfather, Edmund Tudor, was buried in the Carmarthen Grave Friars, and his empty tomb was found there in the course of excavations. And in fact, the tomb itself was located to, relocated to the parish church. So here's the, this is the Carmarthen Grave Friars, and here is the um, choir, and this is the, the tomb that has been relocated to the parish church. But a wonderful description exists for the London Great Friars of all the burials there. Uh, this was made in 1526 by um, a friar, a member of the congregation, and he describes the location and the style of monument for all the people buried in the church. Now this church uh, construction began at the beginning of the 14th century, but they moved some of the founders from the first site of the London Great Friars uh, to the church. And we can see that the space in front of the high altar Basically, all the, all the really top people are buried there. 
over successive generations. Uh, and then we have basically uh, nobility, gentry, and to a degree, uh, the, the better off or the more significant um, merchants buried in the nave and in these chapels here. One of the things that there's absolutely no overlap between is um, royalty, of which there are um, the heart of Edward II is buried there with his wonderful wife. She took it with her to her grave, uh, Isabella, and she's buried there as is Margaret of Anjou. A couple of other uh, prelates as well are buried on the, 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 the side. So that space in some ways was kept very uh, clear of, um, of burials other than those who might really claim to uh, have, a, have a, a very special stake in the history of the friary. But I think this, this particular friary is quite misleading. I mean, because we have this wonderful plan, it's easy to maybe think that this is what most friaries were like. Um, and certainly this probably ticked all the boxes as far as Fitzralph was concerned. And of course, it would have been a new building when he was actually writing. So perhaps uh, he, was, uh, he was very influenced by, by this style. But the great majority of friaries weren't really like that at all. And this is how it's being interpreted today. Uh, you can go there and you can stand on this little path. The, the surviving buildings are uh, post medieval but this is the, the choir of the Grey Friars Church. And so you can work out if you want to uh, where those, those people are actually buried uh, in the choir. More usually, we get something like that. Uh, this is, I always kind of end on this particular slide because it's a, uh, it's a dear and hard memory. As again, possibly some of you know, Greyfriars bus station is no more. It was demolished earlier this year. Uh, and so the experience of looking at that and thinking, oh my goodness. Um, many people say it's the ugliest building in Britain. Well, contestants for that title. But uh, uh, this was, again, very much an example of 1970s archaeology. It was a salvage excavation on the project, uh, which got some stuff, but again, very difficult to make sense of. Um, and I think, obviously, the, the Westgate excavations here are so exciting because everything is being covered in good order and uh, carefully researched and uh, reported. Just a little pitch. I've written a book about Friaries, which I've bought a copy with me. If anybody wants to buy it, they're welcome to do so. The discount price of uh, 25 pounds. Um, and I'm working on another one, which will engage more with the sort of the topics that I've talked about today. Very happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. And uh, in particular, we've been looking at plans of the Grey Friars and the Black Friars, so it's been very um, useful and refreshing to raise our eyes beyond Oxford to look at possible comparison sites. And although um, there are, are that many that survive, the, the buildings that you have shown us are a revelation. I think the range of uh, uh, Coventry. Just one regarding the painting from Ipswich. Oh, yeah. um, what's the attribution of that? Who, who did it? Back to the tone. Um, it's, it's something school, I think. Um, I visited the ruins recently. Mm. Ah, no, uh, what I've got here is the interior of the dormitory is the Ipswich Blackfriars at the end of its use by Ipswich School, circa 1838 to 1842. John Sell Cotman, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. section 82 to 1842. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was actually my school. <laughs> really? <laughs> school is the successor of that year. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting, I feel. Touched a piece of history. <laughs> I, I didn't know that painting existed at all, and a friend who was kind of Googling on, on the internet said, oh, you might be interested in this. And uh, yeah, so it was a very interesting depiction of what would have been a very impressive building. Presumably, 
much grander in some ways actually probably than the, the Gloucester yeah. dormitory that we looked at. The ruins are now inside a sort of one housing estate which is sort of been built up either side and they kind of preserve the ruins, you can sort of wander through them. But there's no project, you don't really get the, the context, do you? No, no, I mean, yeah. no. I mean, some of the walls uh, get, I think there's some arches there, so you get some idea of the size of it. There is, I, again, off the top of my head, I can't remember, there certainly mm -hmm. is a bit that um, I think I was told they decided at the end of the excavation that it was probably not exactly a piece where they were falling, but it, it, wasn't, it didn't fit in with how they, they read the, the mm -hmm. plot, they thought it was a reconstruction of some kind. Mm -hmm. That's another unpublished excavation quite mm -hmm. another one. In fact, there are three priories at Ipswich, all of which had seen some work, and none of which are published. Mm -hmm. Although I think um, Historic England is trying to, to do something about that. Some of their case studies. Um, I think you referred to patent instructions for priories to move into towns. Is that right? And did that only apply to priories rather than to all the religious houses? Um, it was basically the, the Dominicans and the Franciscans were doing that from the beginning. Mm -hmm. they, their mission was to the towns because that was where they could preach, that was where they would get an audience basically, uh, and that's where they, uh, they set up shop in the beginning. The papal directions really reflected what was sent to the Austin friars and the Carmelites. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we have those early foundations that are in other old places. Mm -hmm. And for the, for the Austin friars, there's a very strange little friary at Woodhouse in, um, in Shropshire, I think, that I've never actually been to, uh, to get into. There's nothing standing above ground. Uh, but that's within, within inside a little moated site. And my guess is that that was some lord who had this moated site and decided that they would offer it as a place of residence for uh, some aromatic type monks. And uh, when the direction came to for the order to engage with um, with preaching and, and becoming mendicant, for some reason that those communities they just continued as they were. They didn't. Um, there wasn't a, a total reform which everybody had to do the new thing. There were still places where uh, you could you could hang on to first foundations. It's one of two cathedrals fit into all this because nowadays all those important people that were buried. Um, there are a number of different things I could put up there. Firstly, many cathedral chapters were not satisfied to have friars because they often owned all the benefices of the yeah. parish churches, and so they they saw the friaries as a threat to that. Um, Durham, for example. It was an attempt to have, I think, a Dominican house, no, a Franciscan house there briefly from the 1240s and it ended up in Hartlepool because they, they wouldn't have them. Um, I don't know enough about aristocratic burial in the 13th century to offer an informed comment as to where people would go. But the impression I get is that people were, they preferred to be buried in monastic houses because that's where the Prayers were best, if you like. You had a community <laughs> devoted to um, uh, to praying for the souls of the families and patrons, and so a lot of these became family mausolea, effectively. Uh, I'm trying to think who. I don't know that cathedrals actually sought out the burial of distinguished persons, except insofar as they were also monastic sites themselves. So obviously Westminster Abbey. Has great swathe loads of royalty buried in it because it was the, the Abbey Church, which is was seen as basically the principal mausoleum for, for kings since uh, after Edward the Confessor got away to full, and not every king was buried there. Mm. Um, a happenstance, you know, other circumstances may have dictated that. Edward uh, the Second got murdered and buried in Gloucester Cathedral, and Richard the Second got murdered. And he was buried in a friary to begin with, but he was then moved to Westminster because he already had his tomb built there. Mm -hmm. um, but I get the impression that the nobility had a particular affinity with, with the abbeys and priors that they had founded themselves, and so they expected to be buried there. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, is, the, is your conclusion then that the quote you gave at the beginning is in fact mistaken and exaggeration? Yes. At least for England. Yes. What about 
Europe, though? Well, um, again, I don't want to overreach well, myself, but Europe, which I don't know very much. Continental Western yeah, Europe. Uh, one of the nice things for a medievalist about England is actually the Reformation, because it gives you a very clear uh, point of closure. Uh, the mendicants declined generally in Europe after the Reformation. I mean, the new orders of the Counter-Reformation uh, were not mendicants, but they had a huge role in the conversion of the Franciscans and the conversion of the Americas and in other missionary activities elsewhere. So that's really where the focus of the order seems to have gone. Um, I know that some of the friars didn't continue on the continent, but a lot of them, they were sometimes rebuilt in the, the post-medieval period, and what we have left is not necessarily a good uh, reflection of how they were in the 13th or 14th century. But having said that, I, I would feel confident off the top of my head that there were some pretty posh friars out there, particularly in Italy. Mm. Again, in, in Italy, the, the, the mendicant tradition is continuous. So mm. um, they've been developed and rebuilt. There was a huge fuss in, in the 13th century about the rebuilding of the, um, the church at Assisi because practically separated the order into those who thought this was a really bad idea and those who um, were quite happy to go along with it. And, uh, and there, there were other flashpoints. There was some issue about a friary having barns and the, the purists said, no, you can't have barns because that implies you're storing and you're not supposed to store. Can I just ask you about, um, in terms of uh, comparison sites, and you said the model in relation to uh, towns was that there was no model. <laughs> so is that because they were uh, opportunists or that they were pushed, they were put, kind of squeezed or uh, uh, you know, they didn't have the pick that uh, you know, the kind of more richer, more wealthy uh, orders might have had? I'd say both of those apply. Um, a lot of the early friaries the, the land was often given by quite ordinary people um, who, who gave, you know, a, a, a burgage plot here and a burgage plot there. And the founder was often the person who, who either bought them out or who pulled all that together. Uh, but it, they often made piecemeal on for property divisions that already existed in the town. They might not, of course, have been occupied. So that's an issue that's a, an area of debate in any excavation. It's certainly an issue at Westgate. And was this actually built up uh, and full of burgage plots and, and, and houses and were these cleared? for the Friary, and this is made up land alternatively, which had not been used for, for housing beforehand. So that's a question that has to be asked at every site, I think. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a valid question. But, uh, I, I mean, I haven't shown them all, um, but I have got some pictures of, say, Chester is interesting, because there the Friary precincts are within the Roman walls, um, and they're quite large precincts. There was clearly a lot of space in Chester in the 13th century. Lincoln, there wasn't any space, and all the Friary precincts are outside the walls. Uh, and even in Lincoln, they're often not very big either. So that's why I think you need to look at the biography of the town itself rather than uh, actually looking for some general group. Mm -hmm. No, you were saying that you know, in some of these places you couldn't take, you, you, you know, you couldn't take the pictures because they were so dark. <laughs> that's true of the Coventry, and you couldn't take the upper story. I have no pictures of that. Um, well. I was watching a pro and they, 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 they are bringing out cameras now. Canon have now brought out one that's called a, a, an H2, I think. And this thing is so powerful. You can take pictures in the dark. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. You can't see anything. And yet this thing is taking pictures in colour. Yeah. So it might work. Yeah. Yeah. Get in touch with Canon <laughs> and finding out what they're up to. <laughs> <laughs> that's useful to know, actually. Yeah. The other big problem with taking pictures of the fryers is that they're usually cars parked in front of them. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you have a question? Yes, I was thinking that one, I think it's a London one, where, where there were so many burials in the walls. And I think so many of those were inside the church. Yeah. And I know that when people paid to be buried there, there was the expectation of prayers for them. But mm. were they really going to individually say prayers for all those people? Well, they would have been entered on the obit room, which is probably yes. what was used. So probably in the course of a year, yes, they probably would have said prayers for all of them, but they would have been, you know, All Souls Day, we all get a mention, so um, uh, there would have been uh, specific occasions when there would have been collected prayers. But if your date of death was recorded, I think on, on, the, on the anniversary of that, on the year's month or whatever, you would probably have, you'd be on the list. But one of the problems is that there's only one obelisk actually survives for a crime. 
guilt for it. It's earlier, I think. Yeah. It's, I think it's recognition, yeah. So we have bits and pieces of these lists that were recorded by Leyland and by uh, William Worcester and you know, those kind of guys wandering around the countryside to making notes uh, of old records, which they then translate. Um, there's a, a lovely record from Bodmin, uh, which William Worcester makes, in which he records various people who are buried in the, in the Friary, and then he gives a figure for all the Franciscans who have died in the Great Pestilence. Mm. I can't remember how many it is, but it, it's several thousand anyhow. So clearly that friary had actually somehow got a record of, of the mortality for the order, which was actually prayed for in, in that house. And I was just wondering, are you quite excited about the Westgate then? Is there anything that you're hoping that we're going to find that might add to your kind of, uh, sort of research? And well, I think the thing that, and it sounds like they are finding it, is that they're actually getting decent uh, formal assemblages and uh, you know, stuff around stuff that would give us some clue on to the, uh, about monastic diet in, in good, in good you know, soggy contexts and that sort of stuff. I mean, that is a huge bonus because there's very, very little. I mean, from the earlier Oxford excavations, there's some, uh, but uh, from some unpublished excavations, there's probably some as well. There's certainly stuff that has been done to Hull, uh, but there really is a very, very little material that can be used. What, one of the issues, of course, is that a lot of primary excavations have picked up on the cemeteries and the skeletons and stuff mm. like that. Now, I don't expect to get useful information about medieval nutrition from a Friary church, but that, that's often where the, uh, the excavations were to start if we did know skeletons. We get information about diet from the skeletons, but you can't, you can't just, in some cases, but the Friary cemeteries inside the nave and inside the, the general church are, would have been mixed cemeteries for, for people of all sexes and genders. There doesn't seem to have been an exclusive Friary cemetery that, that has been identified so far, but there are certainly places in the, in the London Grave Friars, one of those. Uh, the walking place is actually where a lot of the friars are buried. So people walking in and out of the cloister would have walked over the graves of the friars and remembered them. And remembered their membership, you know, like of a, of a common purpose. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, if uh, everybody would like to join me and say thank you. To